we are going live again, and this is going to be the light Bible study for November 17th. I went ahead and knocked this one out first, then I'll do the regular reading because it won't take long, and it says we're live, but I know we already were. Uh, technically, it says we were live. Now it says 10 seconds. First, it was saying two minutes or something, and I was like, I hope not because I look like up and I'm not trying to be on camera right now okay so hopefully you caught all that but today so for the insight reading for uh, the light Bible study for November 17th I know I'm so far behind oh my gosh uh, is uh, Matthew 11 verses 25 through 30 and then we're going to continue on in Leviticus uh, verse chapters 21 and 22 and then we're going to read Matthew 28 and I have already prayed, but I'm going to pray again because this is actually a different day's Bible reading. So this was, would have been for November 17th. Father God, we just thank you for each day that you wake us up. Father, help us to remember to always bless you and I bless you, to praise you and to pray to you and to talk to you and to thank you for waking us up in the morning and to always ask you what it is we can do for you, not what you can do for us. Let us be a blessing to others through you and with your word. And I ask that you bless the reading and the hearing of your word. Give us the knowledge, wisdom, discernment, and understanding that we need, Father, as we go through your word and we study it. And let us grow in our walk and relationship with you as well. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let me get to the actual one I need. I think this is... Uh, uh, Leviticus that I'm looking at right here. Um, no, this is mine. Okay. Get on the right thing. Here we go. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so in uh, Matthew 11, 25 through 30, this is another passage where Jesus makes an exclusive claim about himself. He, the Son, one of the three persons of the one Godhead, of the Godhead, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Son, three persons, one God, that he... God the Son is the only way to God the Father. He said no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And we'll read that here in just a minute. Jesus' words comes after he's been rejected in the towns of Galilee. The people had witnessed his miracles and heard his authoritative teaching, yet they refused to believe he was the Messiah. Despite this rejection, Christ extends an invitation to everyone. Come to me, Matthew eleven twenty eight. I have this on one of my signs. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But here it says, come to me, all you who are weary. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And that's 28 and 29. Jesus' audience understands the farming imagery of a yoke. But what does the yoke represent? Bible scholar John D. Berry identifies it as Jesus' teaching. Sin enslaves us, but obedience to Christ and his words bring freedom and peace. And this was written by Tim Gustafson. So, invitation to come to Jesus. Oh, let me get a drink real quick. Let me see if I can fix this to where it's, I don't have to hold the thing. You can hopefully hear me still. And it doesn't have a lot of whispering sounds on it. Like I'm like breathing on the microphone. I hate that. I hate having to hold this thing too. That should surely work. I can't tell if it's, it's not showing me if it's acknowledging it now. But. I'm sure it's fine, because it's just as close as it was. All right. Um, invitation to come to Jesus. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, maker of the universe, Amen. Yes. that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by, the, by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is our Sabbath now. Amen. And the insight story says, when you're weary, and I keep thinking that, that I think it's a Beatles song. When you're weary, feeling small. Uh, no, it's not. The Beatles, God, slap me. Uh, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Water. Love that song. Anyways, um, I sat in the stillness of a work day's end. Oh, what was the name of that? Um, I, I know who it is. It just can't, it's just not coming to mind. My laptop in front of me. I should have been exhilarated about the work I'd finished that day, but I wasn't. I was tired. My shoulders ached with a load of anxiety over a problem at work, and my mind was spent from thinking about a troubled relationship. I wanted to escape from it all. My thoughts wandered to watching TV that night. When I closed my eyes, Lord, I whispered. I was too tired to say more. <laughs> I've had many prayers like that. <laughs> I just start crying, actually. Oof. All my weariness went into that one word, and somehow I immediately knew that that was where it should go. Come to me, Jesus tells us, who are weary and burdened. What am I doing? I'm trying to scroll down. <laughs> who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Not the rest from a good night's sleep. Not the break from reality that television offers. Not even the relief when a problem has been solved, although these may be good sources of rest, the respite they offer is short-lived and dependent on our circumstances. In contrast, the rest Jesus gives is lasting and guaranteed by his unchanging character. He's always good. He gives us true rest for our souls, even amid, tr even amid trouble, because we know that everything is in his control. We can trust and submit to him endure and even thrive in difficult situations because of the strength and restoration only he can give. Come to me, Jesus tells us, come to me. This is written by Karen Huang. When your spirit is weary, where do you go for rest? How will you respond to Jesus when he invites you to go to him? Heavenly Father, remind us that true rest is found only in you, amen. Okay, so we're reading Leviticus 21 and 22 and Matthew 28. So let me bring up the, the wind. It's still the same. Uh, where it picks up where Exodus left off. Uh, they're on their way through the wilderness to Canaan. Uh, the, the tabernacle's already been erected around 1490 BC. Definitions. Tears of holiness, depending on who you were in the camp of Israel, a certain level of holiness was expected of you. The common people were to do their best to keep themselves ceremonially, ceremonially clean. A greater level of holiness was expected from the priest. The highest ex expectation of cleanliness was placed on the high priest. And I missed one. Ignore. Okay. Okay. Let's go all the way down to the outline. Oh, don't start this. There we go. Okay. Is it gonna let me do it this way? I don't think it does. Oh, it might. Hey. Hey. Cool. <laughs> oh, that tickles me. I, you know what? It's better when it's like this for the outline. That's too funny. That's weird. I can see it better when it's like this. Anyway. <laughs> the Holiness of the Priesthood, verses 1 through 9. I'm <laughs> not sure what that is, but okay. The priests were to give special attention to avoiding uncleanliness because they were responsible for offering sacrifices to God. 
The priests were not to make themselves unclean by approaching a person's corpse unless it was that of their father, mother, son, daughter, brother, or virgin sister. Really? Huh. They were not to shave parts of their heads, shave off the corners of their beards, or cut themselves. A priest was not allowed to marry a defiled woman, a divorced woman, or a prostitute. If the daughter of a priest defiled herself by whoring, she was to be burned. Yeesh. Holiness of the High Priest, verses 10 through 15. The high priest was expected to uphold an even higher standard of holiness than the regular priest. He was not to tear his clothes or let his hair hang loose, signs of mourning. He was not to make himself Oh, sorry. He was not to make himself unclean by approaching a dead body, even the body of his mother or father. He was only allowed to marry a virgin. Blemishes amongst the priesthood. Verses 16 through 24. Any of Aaron's sons who had a blemish were not allowed to offer sacrifices to the Lord at the altar. Several blemishes are specifically mentioned. Blindness, lameness, mutilation, deformity, an injured foot, an injured hand, a hunchback, dwarfism, eye defects, itching diseases. Well, I'd be in trouble there if I was a priest and, yeah. Uh, crushed testicles, oh my goodness, and scabs. Oh, oh, a man with any of these conditions was allowed to eat of the holy things of the tabernacle, but they were not to profane the sanctuary of God by offering sacrifices. Crushed testicles? Seriously, though? My God, I don't even want to know how that would happen. That sounds so painful. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, so if we go to the application, sorry, that just made me cringe for every man alive. Jeez. God, ha I have two, I have three boys. Well, th had, I still have two boys. Well, I have three living. One is my step, well, he's technically was my stepson, but I don't believe in stepchildren. He was my son. He's my son, John. But I didn't birth him, but he's still my boy. Application, and then, of course, my two that I did birth. So that's why it bothers me. I'm just a weirdo. Never mind. Anyway, application. God had higher expectations of those in leadership in the camp of Israel. The high priest was expected to maintain a sanctified lifestyle beyond that of the common people. One of these days, I might accidentally get my other son, William, to come to church with me and bring his wife and little girl. That would be awesome. In the modern church, God continues to have higher expectations for those who seek to lead. A unique list of qualifications is given by the Apostle Paul for those who want to serve in the church as elders. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 and Titus 1, 5 through 9. Those qualifications must be met in order for a person to serve. Those qualifications are naturally exclusive. They exclude people whose lives don't meet a certain standard, which is essential to protecting the sanctity of the church. Any attempt to water down or ease the necessary requirements is a disrespect to the church for which Jesus died. Now, I'm going to address this because this was asked to me, and this is, I always thought differently about this, women pastors. Now, I know what Paul taught about it, and what I always understood about the reason why he was saying, you know, the, the church of Corinth you know, and uh, the church of, uh, eh, well, the two different churches where he was saying that women should not be pastors that they should be quiet and should, you know, if they had any questions to ask their husbands when they're at home. What I was told was because two things. One, the women were bringing in pagan stuff into the church and trying to incorporate pagan uh, worship into the church, which they still managed to do that in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, in the church back then. So it still happened. That's what all these saint statues are. That's another, that's a whole different video. And I have proof and I have documentation I can back up what I'm saying. So I'm not just stabbing at Catholics, not talking smack. There's proof of this. So anyways, that's not what my point is. So, but they were bringing in these pagan things, trying to incorporate paganism into the church, the early church. And so that's why women were not allowed to be pastors or teachers or to have any kind of over man, like in that respect. And also, um, also women would sit, not with the men, they'd sit on the other side of the building, you know, like, 
they women would sit on one side and men would sit on the other. And so if the women had to say something to their husband, they would shout across the room, Hey, James, what did he say? What scripture did he say? Where did he say that was at? What did he say? I didn't hear what he said. And they would be disrupting the service, right? And because they were shouting over to their husband, this is, you know, basically kind of what was going on. And so that's why they said the women should not be heard. And if they had any questions, to so wait till they got home and then ask their husband, right? Because they were interrupting the service by shouting across the room. And that's what Paul was talking about. And that's how they justified that women could be pastors. But let's think about this. When Adam and Eve committed the first sin, when God came and, and said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I was hiding for I was naked and I was afraid. He didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? He said, Adam, where are you? He addressed Adam. He addressed Adam, who told you you were naked. He addressed Adam for Adam had committed the sin. And of course, Adam immediately said, this woman that you gave me, you know, but that's nevertheless, you know. But he, he Adam was the one that was held accountable. Adam was the one that was held accountable that they had sinned. Even though it was the woman that was deceived by, by the serpent and gave Adam the apple. But, you know, it says in the scriptures, we read it. He was there with her. So, I mean, he was like hearing the whole conversation. So it's not like she had to go, hey, hey, Adam, come here. Let me show you something. You know, he was right there. That's basically how it says it, right? But everything is, it, the man is held accountable. God created man first, then woman. God has the man over. Jesus is the head. The church is the body. Jesus is a head over the man he is over us right is head over the man and the man is over the woman just as this is saying you know in even in the church that's why women aren't supposed to be elders they're not supposed to be pastors right and they're certainly not to be over men you know now there were some circumstances that there weren't any men there to lead the church, right? So sometimes in that day that there were some female pastors, but only because there were no men to pastor that church in that regard. But um, uh, Wagner, I think, Brody Wagner, Wagner, I think it's his name, he does an excellent teaching. Him and Paul Washer are the two that do an excellent, excellent teaching on why women are not to be Pastor, if you read First Timothy 3, 1 through 7, let me just grab my Bible here, you'll read that the, the qualification for an elder, now back then an elder was also the pastor, basically. We have a different definition now. Now we have elders and we have pastors. But back then the elders basically were the pastors. Well, let's go to First Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and let's read what it says. As soon as I find it here, help if I had my glasses in there. Uh, First Timothy, here we go. Dang, turn right almost to it. That was, that was awesome. That's why I don't want to put this old Bible. It's all tore up. I don't want to put it away. So I'm so used to it. Okay, it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. My first Timothy. Yeah, I'm in the right place. Oh, I'm in two. I'm a dork. Now that starts with that doesn't sound right. Okay, bishops. Okay. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop. Now it says the office of the bishop is the same as the office of the pastor. They are one and the same. He desires a good work. Most pastors during Paul's day were raised up out of the local church. Okay. A pastor or a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. Okay. That kind of narrows it down right there, right? It doesn't go on to say, or the wife of one husband. No. It says the husband of one wife is a caution, I believe, against polygamy. And that's all. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not even addressing, yeah, it's just saying he can't be married to more than one woman. He has to have one wife. 
vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not quarrelsome or greedy, or uh, no alcoholic beverages, or filthy lucre, no money, nor, you know, not money hungry, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one who rules well his own house, carries no idea of a dictatorial attitude, but rather sets the spiritual tone, having his children in subjection with all gravity, refers to obedience. For if a man know how to rule his own house, knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? The case is clear and incontrovertible. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. End of story. End of story. Right there. And then Titus 1, 5 through 9. You know, if we want to just really drive it. And this, this goes the same for deacons and for uh, elders. Because, like I said, elders were also actually the pastors, basically, back then. Where the heck is Titus? Titus is such a tiny little book. I always pass it up. Mm. Oh, for crying out loud. Just cheat and look up the page number. <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time looking up this scripture. Hey, okay, Titus, Titus. There it is. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, because, because, Philemon or Philemon, Philemon, Philemon. How do you say that? It's like four pages later. I want to find it. It's a very short book. This is the lighting in this spot in my room. This is horrible. Okay. Titus, Titus, 1, 5 through 9. So I used to not think there was anything wrong with that. But I have since, in, in deeply studying the word, have found that actually, yeah, no, women are not to be pastors over men. Unless there are no men in the church. Then, that, you know, that's a different story. For this cause left I you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders, or pastors, in every city as I had appointed you. Should have been translated, appointed, appoint pastors in every city. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, again, no polygamist, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. This refers to children who are believers and have proven to be such by proper conduct. For a bishop, Bishop, pastor, elder, shepherd, and presbyter are all interchangeable and refer to the pastor of a local church. Must be blameless as the steward of God. Refers to a man who seeks to be totally consecrated to the Lord. Not self-willed, not soon angry, you know, quick anger, you know, quick tempered. Not given to wine, nor striker. Doesn't have a spirit of contention. Not given to filthy lucre, not money hungry, uh, but a lover of hospitality. Where am, how far am I supposed to go? Oh, nine, okay. Uh, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperament, self control, meaning they don't fly off the handle at the you know, drop of a dime, man. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Suggests the notion of withhold, withstanding opposition and not compromising the word. That he may be able, by sound doctrine, proper teaching, both to exhort and to convince the, the gainsayers. The gainsayers are those who deny and contradict the truth of the cross. So there's two different examples right there that, that, that show exactly why. You know, that, that, that shows that, and I just wanted to touch on that because, you know, when I first started hearing other pastors saying about that women aren't supposed to be pastors, I was like, oh, that's because they're just taking those scriptures that Paul had out of con. But no, if you actually study your word and and study what Paul was talking about and and think about it, and Adam and Eve, Adam was held accountable for the sin, not Adam and Eve. You know, uh, 
it's, it's the man. The man is held accountable. He didn't blame Eve. He blamed Adam. So, because he, Adam is over the woman. The man is over the woman. And God made it that way. She is to be his helper. Not that he is better than him. She's equal with him in that respect. But he is to be over her just as Jesus is over him. Right? Anyway. But I'll, I'll find the links for that one with Brockman. Uh, uh, Bro body Brockman Road, whatever his name is and Paul Washer were there teaching on that to back up my to, to back up what I'm saying anyways continue on right here where it says those qualifications must be met in order for a person to serve those qualifications are naturally exclusive they exclude people whose lives don't meet a certain standard which is essential to protecting the sanctity of the church and so you can't take what God says this is what has to be so for a person to be a bishop or an elder or a deacon you can't say well I'll just overlook this or oh well you know it's okay this is my church and, and it's okay if they have this in their life because I need them no because it's not your church it's God's it's God's house and if you're if you're wavering from what God's Word says it has to be for that person to be in that position that's that's got to be dangerous for that person the person that's holding that position the person that's the that's ahead of that church that's allowing it because you're going against God's word I, I, I that's just my opinion but it would seem to reason anyway I wouldn't do it personally any attempt to water down or ease the necessary requirements is a disrespect to the church for which Jesus died okay well there you go I, I agree with him on that. Let's see, I think that's all he had for that. Yeah. And see, you know, sometimes I know I will speak like this and I will say what I feel about certain things when it lines up with what the Word says. And people get mad at me and, and they'll like stop talking to me and they won't like me anymore because I speak the truth. And so be it, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offend when I speak the truth of God's Word. But it, it is what it is, and that's why there's going to be a very small remnant church left in the end times, because a lot of people don't want to hear the truth, or they don't want to, I don't need to save this, no, just close it, just close it, don't save, thank you. They don't want to hear it because it doesn't tickle their ears, because it might cramp their lifestyle, you know, or because, you know, it might, it might, I don't know, I don't know, just some people just don't, you know, that's, that's what the apostasy, the end times church is all about, the apostasy church is, you know, they don't want to hear the scary stuff in the scary books of the Bible, because they want to keep their heads buried in the sand. You know, they just want to hear the good stories, the good books. They want to hear the good messages that makes them feel all warm and fuzzy when they leave the church. You know, that's, that's, that's basically works then because you're just going to church on Sunday to hear your warm and fuzzy uh, message for the umpteenth thousandth time probably. Uh, and so you've done your deed for the week. That is a lukewarm Christian and that is a fake Christian and that is a lukewarm church. And, you know, those, those type of people that sadly, very sadly, when they are standing before Jesus, he is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because he isn't going to know who they are. You know, God gave us these scriptures that teach us his Bible prophecy so that we can see the signs of the times. And as Brandon Holthouse put it, and I love this and I use it, is... Bible prophecy is not to scare us. It is to prepare us. I mean, if Jesus got so upset with the Pharisees because they could look at the sky and see that it was red and know that it was going to do this or that, they could tell by the signs of how the sky looked and what the weather was going to be, but they couldn't tell the signs of the Messiah standing right in their face talking to them, how upset he got with them for that. You know, I sure don't want to be like them and not recognize the signs of the times. I don't want Jesus to come as a thief in the night. I want to be ready. I want to have my wicks trimmed and I want to have plenty of oil and be ready for the trip. 
that I'll be going on to go to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen? Anyway, Leviticus 21, Regulations for Conduct of Priest. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. Also his virgin sister, who is near to him, who has had no husband. For her he may defile him himself. Otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy to their God, and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God. Therefore they shall be holy. They shall not take a wife who is a harlot. Uh, or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband. For the priest is holy to his God. Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire. He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes, nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord, and he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow of, or a divorced woman, or a defiled woman, or a harlot. These he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife, nor shall he profane his posterity among his people, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach a man blind or lame, who has a marred face or any limb too long, a lamb, I mean, I'm sorry, a man who has a broken foot or broken hand, or is hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema or scab, or is a eunuch. Oh, that's what they mean when they say crunched testicles, a eunuch. So they've just been, uh, uh, what's that word when they, <sighs> yeah, that. No man of the descendants of Aaron, what they should do to pedophiles. Yeah, that. Cut them off. No man of the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect, shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar, because he has a defect, lest he profane my sanctuaries. For I, the Lord, sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel. Whoops. Okay. And then let's go to uh, Leviticus 22. Okay. So the wind is still the same. Definitions. Holy food. Certain portions of the Israelite sac sacrifices were given to the priests for food. This included meat from the animals being offered and bread or flour from the grain offerings. This food was special and could only be eaten by people, a certain people who had a connection to the priesthood. And let's see, let me get past the application. I don't know why it does that if I just try to scroll too fast. That's so weird. All right, here's the outline. Okay, so verses 1 through 16. The holy food from the tabernacle. No priest was allowed to eat of the contributions and holy food from the tabernacle while they were unclean. 
If a priest was unclean as a result of touching an unclean thing, he had to wash himself with the water in the evening before being permitted to eat of the holy things again. The common Israelite people were not allowed to eat the holy things unless they were a person born in the priest's house or a slave bought with the priest's money. If a person accidentally ate some of the holy food, they were to restore what they ate to the priest with one-fifth of the value added to the total. Animals fit for sacrifice. Uh, verses 17 through 33. The Israelites were not allowed to bring blemished animals as burnt offerings or as peace offerings. Oh, I misspelled peace. How funny is that? Any animal affected by blindness, mutilation, or uh, disability, an itch, a scab, damaged testicles, or other elements were not permitted to be offered. An animal had to be at least eight days old before it was eligible. Castrated. Sorry, that's the word I was trying to think of. I don't know. I could have went the rest of my life without having to remember that word. Uh, eight days old before it was eligible to be used as a sacrifice. Huh. Interesting. At least eight days old, because that's how old the babies were whenever they had to wait till they were eight days old, and that's when they would circumcise them. Of course, on the eighth day, the vitamin K was the highest in their body, in their blood, and so there would be minimal bleeding. That's why they did it on the eighth day. But that's, um, excuse me, uh, I didn't mean to burp. An animal had to be at least eight days old. So that's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I'm going to have to check into that. A cow or sheep and its offspring were not to be killed together at the same time. Oh, gosh. If an animal was offered as a sacrifice of Thanksgiving, the entire animal was to be eaten the same day. Interesting. Okay, if you heard that, I'm sorry. That was really loud. That was me crunching my water. When Bishop Ron passed away, he was uh, pastor from my old church that I went to for like 20 years. God, that sucked that he died. That sucked, that sucked. I really loved him. You know, he was probably the, no offense, Pastor Ken, or my other Pastor Ken Johnson, but he's the best pastor I've ever, 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 ever had. Loved his preaching. We were at his memorial at the church and I didn't used to do that with my water bottles. I'd scrunch them down and then put the lid back on and keep them crunched small. My daughter showed me that. And I was just so upset at his passing. I just thank God that I went up. He was in the hospital that my mom died in and I was there alone with her. She went in on a Wednesday and she died on a Saturday. I mean, we just absolutely blindsided this. We did not expect that. And, she had been transferred from Kingfisher Hospital to Oklahoma City Hospital, the one at, like, I think it's 44th and Western or 59th and Western, whatever. Uh, anyways, so I don't like going to that hospital because my dad was just too tore up, so my sister took him and my boys with her because I, they didn't want to, you know, I didn't want them to see their grandma like that. And my dad was just, he was just done. I mean, it, he was, it was over for him seeing my, he knew mama was gone. and. So they all left, and I'm there by myself, and I had to stay, and I didn't have to, but I did, of course I had to, stay with my mom until she passed, and that I just tried to avoid that hospital. But I went, we went and saw Bishop Ron there, and I so had a point to this, and I have no idea what it, what it was now that I was gonna say about him. Wow. But I have no idea what I was going to say about Bishop Ron, about that hospital or anything. I just, it's just gone now because I just got to thinking about him. Well, that got it. Well, what the heck, Debbie? All right, well, it's, it, maybe it'll come back to me because I have no clue now what I was going to say. <sighs> and just like that, my brain just, it's gone. Application. Okay, quit, computer. God expects more than our leftovers. God didn't accept offerings from the leftover animals of the Israelite flocks. It would have been so real, it would have been no real sacrifice to offer a sick animal to the Lord, and it certainly wouldn't have been a blessing to the priest. While we don't offer animal sacrifices, we sell, we all offer something. God, I just take my glasses off, I can see this. I'm nearsighted, but this is big enough that it's, I don't need my glasses, it makes it harder to read. 
Do you give God the best of your time, money, brain power, physical energy, attention, affection, and service? Ooh. I try. I try to, but I know I fail miserably. I know I do better than I used to. I spend a lot of time studying his word and as you, we, we read his word, but as far as spending time like praying, I don't because like here at the house, I can never, I never ever have any time to myself with no one else here. Brandon's here 24 seven. My son never leaves this house, never leaves. Ne ne never leaves the house, never. And James only works like 18 hours a week, so he's not, you know, he's here most of the time. So I just, it's really hard for me to have any time to, because I mean, I could, I don't care where I am in the house. They could both be engrossed in doing something and I could go in the kitchen and, and, and when I pray, I like to pray out loud and I could be praying to God. And as soon as I start praying to him, and I don't talk real loud, so they won't hear me talking, so they won't be like thinking someone's here. As soon as I start talking, here one of them come without fail. I could go out in the garage and start praying, and lo and behold, here one of them will come. I, it's, it's, it's incredible. So I don't pray like I should. I talk to God all the time, but I don't actually just sit down and pray. But he knows my heart. I, I talk to him in my head a lot. I have to because that's the only time I can that someone won't, Satan won't send someone immediately to interrupt. Anyway, we don't, and, and as far as money though, I do, um, well, I was. I'm going to just start holding out the money out of my money and paying my tithe myself. So that way I know it's actually getting paid because it hasn't been in that really really upset me greatly because I've always been adamant about paying tithe one way or the other so we don't want to offer God the leftovers of all those things after we are we've nearly exhausted them on selfish and worldly pursuits right like when I finally crawl in the bed after doing all these other things and going ah, good night father yeah and I'm guilty of that too uh, God deserves the best of us and his kingdom is the best place to expand the balances of our resources And that's true because he did give us his best. Amen. He doesn't ask much for us. Well, I mean you think about it You know think about someone that you love dearly like if you have a spouse or a child And you never talk to him Especially if you live in the same house with him. You never talk to him. Oh wait that <laughs> I'm living that I'm living that I'm living that, but no, seriously, um, but someone that you just really love, you know, you, you, you claim you love them, but you never talk to them. You know, you might you like take a couple of minutes, maybe a minute or two and just say, hey, hi, love you. Okay, good night. And that's it. You know, just, I mean, just imagine if your relationship with your child or with your spouse was the same as your relationship is with God. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, you know, that's one thing I try to do is to kind of get me, encourage me to spend more time talking to him because God loves to hear from us. He does. I mean, I love it when I hear from my kids. Well, unless they're, well, let me back that truck up because sometimes the only time I hear from them is when they need something. <laughs> So, and there may be times I'll be like, I'm not here. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm asleep. <laughs> I'm not here. Don't, don't answer that phone. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, Leviticus 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they, by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Say to them, Whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has uncleanness upon him, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper 
or has a discharge shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. And whoever, whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has had an emission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water. And when the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward he may eat the holy offerings, because it is his food. And whatever dies naturally or is torn by beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself with it. I am the Lord. There, they shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby, if they profane it. I, the Lord, sanctify them. No outsider shall eat the holy offering. One who dwells with the pres priest or a hired servant shall eat shall not eat the holy thing. But if the priest buys a person with his money, he may eat it. And one who is born in his house may eat his food. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat of the holy offerings. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child and has returned to her father's house as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. Offerings accepted and not accepted. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel, and say to them, Whatever man of the house of Israel, or of the strangers in Israel, or who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows, or for any of his free will offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering, you shall offer of your own free will a male without blemish from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Whatever has a defect, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable on your behalf. And whoever offers a sacrifice of a peace offering to the Lord to fulfill his vow, or a free will offering from the cattle or the sheep, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or broken or maimed, or have an ulcer or eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them on the altar to the Lord. Either a bull or a lamb that has any limb too long or too short that you may offer as a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed, nor or torn or cut, nor shall you make any offering of them in your hand, in your land, nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them, and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day and thereafter it shall be accepted as an offering made by fire to the Lord. Whether it is a cow or, or you, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. And when you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. On the same day it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord. Therefore you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Amen. Man, it sounds like the wind is kicking it out there. Sheesh. Don't save. Right, and then last but not least, the meth. Matthew 28. Okay. Yeah, we're just doing all of 28. So, verses 1 through 4. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. The time of these events is significant. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to Jesus' tomb after the Sabbath, which is a Saturday. Well, 
sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday is the Sabbath. Around the dawn of the Sunday sun, first day of the week, which is Sunday. Uh, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Yeah, I probably would too. Side note, we will not attempt to extract all of the details of the resurrection mentioned in other gospel accounts and add them to this study. Rather, we will add them and harmonize them as we work through those books. It is, however, important to have a general knowledge of the other resurrection accounts so we don't draw false conclusions from Matthew's text. Verses 2 through 4 are a good example. And the events in verses 2 through 4 are not witnessed by the two Marys. They take place before the Marys arrive. Some time passes between the events of verse 4 and verse 5. Before the women arrived, there was an earthquake, and an angel of the Lord rolled back the stone which stood at the entrance of the tomb. The guards charged with keeping the tomb closed were so terrified they became like dead men. Okay, and then verses 5 through 8. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, <coughs> excuse me, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Now when the women arrived, the angel informed them Jesus was no longer there. Christ had risen and the place in the tomb his body had once occupied was vacant. The angel tells them to find the apostles and let them know the Lord will meet them in Galilee just as he had promised. Jesus had mentioned this while eating the Passover meal. In Matthew 26, verses 31 and 32, Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Mary and Mary ran to accomplish their mission with fear and great joy. Fear was a very common emotion experienced by those in the Bible who encountered spiritual beings. Go figure! Joy would have filled their hearts at the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Heck yeah, I'd have been joyful too to know my Savior is alive. Because you know, there's a song that says, Though sorrow may come through the night, your joy comes in the morning. I'm treating my sorrows. You know that song? Yeah, anyway. Uh, so, then verses 11 through 15. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Even though after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to, I believe it was 400 people. So, uh, four or 500, I want to say it's 400 people. That there's historical documentation that they said that he appeared to him, them. So, anyway, okay. Upon waking some of the guards, who had become like dead men, went into Jerusalem to inform the chief priest of what had happened. They agreed with the elders to pay off the guards, instructing them to lie if asked about what had happened. They were to tell people the apostles stole the body while they were asleep. This would have been a pretty, would have been a pretty embarrassing story for a Roman guard to spread, but the money and the chief priest promised to protect them must have been sufficient. Because normally, if a Roman soldier fell asleep on his post and a prisoner escaped or something like that, they would probably just fall on their own sword because they know they were going to be put to death anyway. 
and rather than be crucified, they should be more merciful just to kill themselves. Um, Roman guards face serious punishment for neglecting the things entrusted to them, even death in some cases. This lie became very popular among the Jews. No doubt the Jewish rulers worked very hard to promote it. Okay, and then in the application for this, not the whole thing, just for thus far, first 15 verses, I'm just determined to jerk that cord out. My gosh. Some people will never believe because they don't want to believe. Jesus had predicted his resurrection in three days. The Jews had done everything possible to squelch rumors about a third day resurrection. Jesus is unexplainably missing on the third day. This event, along with the multitudes of miracles in Jesus' ministry, were more than sufficient evidence to believe in Christ. The fact that he raised Lazarus from the dead on the fourth day of being dead should have told them, told them everything they needed to know, if nothing else did, that he was the Messiah. Just saying. But they still wouldn't. They came up with a highly unbelievable lie to keep them from having to believe. And you know, if you tell a lie enough, you will eventually believe it. And then another application, be careful before swallowing a narrative just because it is popular. People could really learn from these words right about now. Because the narrative that the mainstream media is putting out there is insanity. The chief priests and elders had lots of money and lots of influence, and they promoted the narrative about these events that became very popular. You know, the deep state, the, the, the certain people, they own the media, and they control the media, and they tell the media what they could say, so that's you know, so why I don't watch the news anymore. Yeah. But it was dead wrong. Just because some people with money and influence and prestige push a narrative doesn't make it true, and doesn't mean its conclusions heavily biased. Reminds me of an evolutionary narrative. Think about what's going on nowadays. Just saying. Just, just saying. Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Excuse me. The final scene of the book of Matthew is the departure of Jesus back to heaven. The apostles went to a mountain, not specified, on which the Lord had arranged to meet them. When they saw Jesus, they worshipped, and some doubted. You may wonder, as I did, how can they still have doubts? The other Gospels revealed they had met with Jesus and even touched him. Have you ever wanted something so badly that when you got it, even when it was in front of your eyes, you remained skeptical? Yes. Rather than giving yourself over to joy, you were slow to believe for fear you were deceived and your joy would be taken away from you because it was too good to be true. Probably where the phrase, oh, <laughs> I swear I didn't see that, too good to be true comes from. This is the sentiment where behind the happy expression, I can't believe it. For some of the 11, it was going to take more time to believe it was real. I used to have someone say that. about me. That was so sweet. But we know they all eventually found the evidence compelling enough to live and die to share the reality of Jesus' resurrection. He's with the Lord now. He's in God's hands, so he's, he's, he had liver cancer. It had spread to his lymph nodes and he was, he was in a lot of pain, so God was merciful and took him quick. He actually was a heart attack that took him out. So it was it was a quick and relatively somewhat painless. He didn't suffer long. So I'm at least grateful for that. And Jesus came okay, uh, verses eighteen and nineteen. Sorry, it was just in April of this year and I've known I've known that person since ninety six, so I was married to him for a very, very long time. Anyway, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, um, uh, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Speaking of Holy Spirit, you see it says Holy Spirit. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible is the Holy Spirit referred to as Holy Ghost? Think about what you think. What do you think of when you hear the word ghost? You think of an unembodied spirit of a dead person, right? Or a demon or something like that, right? Ghost. Nowhere in the Bible is the divine third person of the Godhead, God, the Holy Spirit, referred to as the Holy Ghost. But yet people call him the Holy Ghost. I have never liked that. I always cringed at that. He's always been the Holy Spirit to me. I don't know why people call him the Holy Ghost because it's certainly not in the Bible. You will not find that word anywhere in the Bible talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is divinity because it's God, the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Godhead. Anyway, I digress. All authority necessary to redeem a people, gather his church, defend them against every spiritual evil, defeat sin and death, and bring them to God, belong to Christ. It is only in Christ and in his kingdom that these things are possible. Now these things had been revealed to the apostles. They were commanded to go tell others so that they too could be a part of the eternal kingdom. They were to make disciples of all nations and baptize them by the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The application, many churches seem to ignore Jesus' instruction of baptism. Some churches don't baptize. Some do it sporadically. Some suggest it's a good thing to do if you get around to it. But as we see in this passage, pa baptism is commanded. Now, it is as clear as any other command in the Bible, and we shouldn't ignore it. When we study the book Acts, we will see a very clear precedent of baptism accompanying conversions. People got baptized when they realized they needed Christ. Now, I'm kind of tiptoeing around that because I hope he's talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because we've already done a teaching where it, it, he was saying that you're not required to be baptized in water. That's not what gives you salvation. Your salvation is through Jesus. And when you get truly saved through Jesus and through his blood and what he did on Calvary, that is when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because just like when Peter went to uh, those Gentiles, to the Gentiles' home, and he was telling them the gospel, to, you know, sharing the gospel with them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they immediately started speaking in tongues, right? And they hadn't been baptized in water, and that is because once you, uh, once you get saved, truly saved, and redeemed through the blood of Christ, and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have to be baptized in water, because the flesh has already been in water. That is not necessary, but you do have to, Acts 2.38, read in Acts 2.38 what Peter says, you have to repent and believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and that he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died, and paid the price for sin for the whole world, past, present, and future, and rose again. And if you do this and you believe this and you repent of your sins and confess that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. You are truly saved. and you. You know, and you won't necessarily be baptized in the Holy Spirit at that exact moment. It doesn't always happen at that exact moment. And, and you know, a lot of people can tell you that too. But here we go. Uh, an application, the word Trinity isn't used in the Bible. Oops. But verses show why that understanding of the nature of God exists. People didn't just make up the triune God idea. It comes from the Bible. This is true. The word Bible isn't in the Bible either. The apostles were to teach the new disciples to observe all of Jesus' commands. Jesus then reassures them. Oh, he will be with them until the end of the age. No doubt this references the end of time, Matthew 13, verses 39 and 49. This would have been comforting to a group of apostles who probably felt inadequate to carry out the mission given to them. They would all rely heavily 
on the help sent from Christ to complete their role in the early church. <laughs> what am I hearing? Yeah. I think it is also appropriate to apply this promise to ourselves. Christ will not, ab will not abandon us as we seek to serve him in this life. Amen, amen, amen. That is true. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as we go to share, as, oh no, no, no. As we, as we go to share the gospel, the Holy Spirit will speak to us, through us, for us, and give us the words to say. He will let us know who he wants us to, to speak to and who he wants us to plant the seed in. You know, he'll let us know. You know, I've been, we were in, James and I were in Walmart one day. We had, I think, our chosen gear on, you know, chosen shirts or whatever. And this lady called us over to her. And she said, I need y'all to pray. I need, I need you to pray for uh, these, these young kids. Um, there was a couple of teenagers or something. And there was an accident. And I, and I think they got hit by a car. Um, one of them, she said she knows one of them died. And the other one's like in critical condition or something. I don't really remember the whole situation. Um, it, was, it was a pretty sad scene. They, they were... I think they, oh, I don't remember what it was, but they definitely need prayer for the family that just lost their loved one and for the one that was hanging on to life. But she asked us, she asked us to pray for those kids and for their families. And so we're standing in Walmart neighborhood market and we were like, absolutely. So we just like locked hands with her and we prayed out loud right then and there because Bishop Ron had always taught us that if someone asked you to pray for them, asked you if you would pray for them, you need to do it right then and right there. It doesn't matter where you're at. Who cares? If you don't want to hear me praying, get away from me. You know, you don't have to listen. Walk away. Put something in your ears. Um, and so we did. We prayed. We prayed. And it's not, you know, we, we didn't do it to be like the people standing on the street corners, you know, to get all the attention and look at us. Hey, you know. No, we were doing it because we wanted her to know that you, want, you asked us to pray. We're going to do it right now. So that way she knows that those folks were prayed for. And that also ministers to other people that see this, that see that we were not ashamed of our, of our Lord and we were willing to pray right then and there. And that's how it should be. And I've always, I've always respected Ron in, in teaching that because I think that's true, absolutely true. But anyway, that ends this one. I'm gonna go ahead and do the other part of the reading for the 17th and then get started on the next one. I hope y'all have a blessed uh, last three minutes of today. Hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope you didn't eat too much. And if you did, I hope you get a good nap. It got a good nap in. But I'm just glad that God blessed you to be able to eat too much. Shalom for now. I love you and Jesus loves you. And remember always, there's never a pit too deep that he isn't willing to pull you out of. He just waits and knocks and hopes you'll hear his voice and open the door. Amen. Good night.